I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. You caught me playing Mozart. Performers love to play Mozart. Singers love to sing Mozart. He's balm for the soul. The music is so elegant and so beautiful. The lines so clean. The problem with Mozart, though, is if one of those notes is out of sync, if you drop one thing, the whole structure can fall in like a house of cards. Let's talk a little bit about Mozart. I'm sure most of you know the basics of his biography. But just to remind you, he was born in 1756 in Salzburg in Austria. To a musical family, his father was in the service of the Archbishop Prince of Salzburg. And through most of Mozart's early life, he worked also for this Prince Archbishop. When he was about 17 or 18, though, he got um, a little bit of a wanderlust in him and he moved to Vienna. This was in 1781. There are various theories why Mozart moved to Vienna from Salzburg. One of them, of course, is the fact that Salzburg, relatively speaking, was a kind of rural backwater. But more importantly, I think, Salzburg did not have an opera theater. And Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart wanted to make his fame, wanted to make his living and his mark as an opera composer. Well, he was certainly true to his word. After he moved to Vienna, he wrote a number of operas, and they're all terrific. La Clemenza di Tito, The Magic Flute, Le Nozze di Figaro, Don Giovanni, The Abduction from the Seraglio, and Così Fan Tutte, the subject of tonight's opera talk. The three greatest of these operas was surely Don Giovanni, Le Nozze di Figaro, and Così Fan Tutte, the operas with which Mozart collaborated with the great poet Lorenzo da Ponte. Lorenzo da Ponte was a fascinating character, and he had many careers during his extremely long life. He was a poet, of course, a philosopher, an impresario. Even at one point, he was a grocer. Let me tell you a little bit about Da Ponte's biography. He was born Emanuele Conigliano in Ceneda, the Jewish ghetto of Venice. This was in the mid-18th century. His mother died when he was relatively young, and his father wished to remarry a beautiful young Catholic girl. In order to do that, the whole family had to be baptized Catholic, and so he very happily brought the entire family into the faith, and at the same time changed their name to the name of the bishop who baptized them. His name happened to be Da Ponte, and so the oldest boy became Lorenzo Da Ponte. Another hitch was this. The father demanded that all three sons enter the seminary and become priests, and so Lorenzo entered the seminary. But I'm afraid he wasn't a very good priest. In fact, in his autobiography, many years later, he says that there was only one vocation that he was most ill-suited to, and that was becoming a priest. He was a very liberal thinker, and while teaching in the seminary, the church banned him from teaching because he was a little bit too free with his thoughts. So he moved to Venice. Now, Venice was a wild place at that time. There were brothels and gambling institutes and casinos. And people were partying constantly. In fact, aristocrats, having a good time in Venice, had to mask themselves and wear costumes in order to avoid roving eyes of their enemies. He took up residence in a brothel, living openly with a woman. One of the stories about Da Ponte during this time was that he would dress up in full ecclesiastical garb, pick up his violin, and go into the lobby and entertain the paying customers. Well, the civil authorities weren't terribly happy about this kind of behavior, so they banished him from Venice altogether for 15 years. Da Ponte then travels throughout Europe, eventually ending up in Vienna, where he met the great opera librettist Pietro Metastasio, the greatest librettist up to that point in the history of opera. Metastasio loved his poetry and in turn introduced him to Antonio Salieri, the court composer. Salieri recommended him to the emperor as court dramatist, and that's what Da Ponte was for 10 years. 
This is, of course, the period in which he met Mozart and began to collaborate with him on these three wonderful operas, The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Così fan tutte. But let me tell you just a little bit more about Da Ponte's life, because it continues until 1839. He meets a young English woman in Vienna, marries her, and moves to London, where he became the assistant manager of the King's Theatre, Haymarket. He made a lot of enemies in London and actually went broke two or three times, decided to uproot his entire family and move to the United States in 1805. So he ends up here in this country, in New York actually, uh, and, and he had many, many jobs. Uh, he was an impresario, bringing the first Italian opera troupe to New York City. He was at one point the first teacher of classical languages and Italian at Columbia University. He was as well a developer and fundraiser, actually building, nearly single-handedly, the very first Italian opera house in New York City. My favorite story about Da Ponte, however, is this. The librettist of Don Giovanni, Così fan tutte, and Le Nozze de Figaro was selling Italian sausages on the streets of Greenwich Village. Così fan tutte is subtitled A School for Lovers, and that's exactly what it is. This is the only completely original plot that da Ponte wrote for Mozart. He wrote The Marriage of Figaro, which of course was based on the earlier Beaumarchais play, and he wrote the libretto for Don Giovanni, based on an ancient European legend of Don Juan. But it's not completely original. There are parallels in the literature that da Ponte knew so well. Boccaccio, Ovid, Ariosto, and even in Shakespeare. The San Diego opera production of Così is dated in the days just before World War I and set in a beach resort very much like this one. Well, let's talk about the plot of Così fan tutte and stick with me, it's a little confusing. There are two pairs of lovers. Ferrando, a tenor, is in love with Dorabella, a soprano. Guglielmo, a baritone, is in love with Fior di Ligi. All right, you're following me so far. Ferrando, Dorabella, Guglielmo, Fior di Ligi. Now, the two women are sisters, and they have a maid, as most of the bourgeois women of the mid-18th century had. Uh, her name is Despina, and she gets involved in the plot later on. The two men are soldiers, and they have an older friend by the name of Don Alfonso. Now, Alfonso is a cynical philosopher. At the beginning of the opera, Alfonso wagers the two young soldiers that if they were to disappear, if they were to leave town, for instance, uh, to go to an imaginary war, for any amount of time whatsoever, the two young women would be unfaithful to them. Well, of course, the young men protest. They violently protest. They almost pull their swords on Alfonso, but he says, wait a minute, give me 24 hours, follow my plot, and I will prove to you that all women are incapable of fidelity. Well, he devises that the young men go off to war. There's a beautiful sequence where Fior di Ligi and Dorabella wave goodbye to these soldiers. And then Alfonso has them come back in disguise in these exotic outfits with headdresses and caftans and large mustaches to hide their identities. He calls them Albanians, but really they can be disguised as just about anything. The point is, when they come back, they woo the other's lover. So Ferrando, the tenor, woos Fior di Ligi, and Guglielmo woos Ferrando's lover, Dorabella. After lots of typical opera buffa complications in the plot, we come to the end of the opera, and the women have indeed fallen in love with the young strangers. They've fallen in love with the wrong lovers. At one point towards the end of the opera, Alfonso turns to the man and he says, don't worry about it, don't get so excited about this, that's the way women are. Così fan tutte. They're all like that. Sound cynical? Well, it is. As a matter of fact, from the moment that this piece hit the opera boards, hit the theater, Critics again and again condemned it 
because the libretto they found weak. They said the libretto was nowhere near the genius of Mozart's music. The problem is these critics look at Così fan tutte only from the standpoint of the libretto. You've got to judge an opera by the way the libretto and the text connect with the music. The libretto may tell us that all women are incapable of fidelity, which of course is not true. We all know that. But the music tells us that everybody in this opera is a fool. The music tells us that the women have been duped, the women have had a pretense visited upon them, uh, they've been terribly unfairly treated, and at the end, all lovers are fools. The title of the opera, Così fan tutte, as I said before, comes from the body of the work, comes from the libretto itself. Don Alfonso sings the aria, Tutto accusan le donne, and in it he actually sings the words Così fan tutte to the two young soldiers. Here's the melody. Così fan tutte. And then the men join him in harmony. Così fan tutte. Well, you can't get any more obvious than that. The interesting thing is that the same language, the very same line, comes from an earlier libretto by Da Ponte for Mozart, Le Nozze di Figaro. The character of Don Basilio actually sings Così fan tutte le belle. All beautiful women are like that. To this tune. Mozart very cleverly weaves that tune into the overture of Così. Here it is. Very cleverly handled indeed. You've probably noticed that in this series we spend a little bit of time on text painting, which is what I call it, where a, a composer deals with the text in some very subtle way or underlines the text musically. We talked about it with Verdi and with Carlisle Floyd. Mozart does very much the same thing. In this duet between the two sisters, Dorabella and Fiordeligi, at the beginning of the opera, they compare portraits of their two lovers and talk about how handsome, how wonderful these two guys really are. And the duet percolates along rather nicely, the you know, machinery, the musical machinery working very, very well. And we come to a point where everything stops dead. That's on the word amore, the word love. Listen to what happens. Amore. And again, and then the duet simply picks up from where it left off. It's a wonderful way for Mozart to say that amore, love, is what this piece is about. He takes the music and stretches it. And there's even a wonderful little moment in the accompaniment, a little scale passage. Some critics say that that upwardly mobile scale passage is indicative of erotic love. And well, it's not hard to believe that these two girls are erotically charged by these two men, Guglielmo and Ferrando. There's one more wonderful example of text painting in the opera, and it's at the moment where the girls are standing on the dock waving goodbye to the men as they leave. Listen to this. That accompaniment figure is very much like wave motion, isn't it? Well, the men are on a boat floating off into sea to that imaginary war that Don Alfonso has devised for them. 
And so Don Alfonso and Dorabella and Fiore de Ligi stand on the dock and wave goodbye as the boat goes off out of the harbor. Well, I hate to scandalize you, but there's a real problem with the music of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. The problem is this. We know it far too well. Every time we turn on a classical radio station, all we hear is Mozart, Mozart, Mozart. And the problem is this. We're so familiar with that elegant style, with that late 18th century milieu which he creates so beautifully, that sophisticated line, the gorgeous melodies, that we hear only the notes. And so when we go to a Mozart opera and the music is applied to a text or applied to a drama, again, all we hear is the music. We don't try to connect the music to the text in our own ears. We have to apply to Mozart's operas the same kind of criticism that we would apply to any opera, an opera of Verdi, for instance, or of Carlisle Floyd, of Alban Berg. We have to ask ourselves, what is the text saying? And then on top of that, a whole other reality, what is the music saying about the text? In the case of Cozy, there's lots of pretense, lots of fabrication, many lies. But what is the music telling us? The music you're listening to takes place at the end of the opera when the four lovers are sitting down at a table ready for a banquet, but they're drinking glasses of wine. The two women are singing passionate love phrases to these two strangers. They are, in fact, on the verge of signing a marriage contract with them, and they're less than 24 hours away from their original lovers. Ferrando, the tenor, is singing passionate love phrases back to Fiore de Ligi, but of course, it's all a lie. He doesn't really love her. He loves Dorabella, his true love. Guglielmo, on the other hand, underneath the other three voices, is singing to the glass, singing essentially the fact that, well, this may be filled with wine, but I wish this glass were filled with poison because right now I want to die. And all of this in the context of music that undulates and wavers from note to note, never resting, never landing, giving us the concept that they're all getting just a little bit tipsy. So we have a moment here in the music and the text of love spoken, lies proffered, hearts broken, and a context of overall drunkenness that Mozart won't let us forget. Così fan tutte, the opera, is very much like this ocean, beautiful and placid on top. But the cynic's view is that underneath that beautiful exterior are jellyfish, rays waiting in the soft, wet sand to prick us with their stingers, sharks waiting to tear us apart. The supposed fickleness of women is not the subject of Così fan tutte. No one comes out of this plot unscathed. If the women's faithfulness is undone, the men's pride, vanity, and rose-colored concepts of reality are all shattered beyond repair. It's a piece that begins as a frivolous comedy and turns deadly serious at its center as the women give in to the passionately dressed pretense of the men and come out at the end wiser but scarred and unsure in love. Does the music give us any clue of that? Let's look at the moment where it's revealed by the men, particularly by Don Alfonso, that the entire plot has been a contrivance, that the women have been cruelly tricked throughout all of this. How do the women react? With abject repentance? Um, with anger? With sorrow? I find it very interesting what Mozart does with this particular moment. Here is what Alfonso says to them. Oh, yes, I tricked you, but join hands, you are betrothed, embrace and be silent. Now all four of you may laugh, and you may laugh again, for I am laughing. Well, I'm not so sure that the ladies are laughing. 
The first words out of their mouth are this. If this is true, and in the Italian it's idol mio, se questo è vero, se questo è vero, if this is true. Now listen to what Mozart does. He repeats the two phrases, idol mio se questo è vero, is it true, vero, truth. Vero. And it's cut off. He repeats the same phrase. Vero. Then he holds the last syllable of vero. I find this significant. It's the same word within eight measures treated completely differently. It's as if there are two different if inflections of the word truth. <laughs> A very important word to have two different inflections on. It's almost as if Dorabella and Fioradeligi are saying, well, if this is true. If this is true, you see, two completely different inflections written into the music. To me, it's saying that the women now may never ever be able to trust these men again. That the relationship has been destroyed. That perhaps at the end of this opera, all is not well. Once more. There are lots of interruptions like this, interruptions of the momentum in the finale of Così van Tutte. And to me, that's Mozart in his elegant 18th century way saying, we're not really sure how this opera is going to end. Ferrando and Dorabella may be getting back together. Guglielmo and Fiordeligi may be getting back together. But if they stay together, well, that's the question. There is no lack of excellent recordings of Così fan tutte. In fact, there are nearly 30 recordings of Così fan tutte, some of them live, some of them studio recordings, and many of them are quite good. One of the finest is surely an early recording with Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Nan Merriman, Leopold Simoneau, conducted by Herbert van Karajan. This is one of the classic performances of Così. There's also a live recording from that era that I want to point out to you because it's so inexpensive. The recording company called Gala is putting out recordings of live performances from the Wiener Staatsoper and from the Salzburg Festspiele. And these recordings are absolutely wonderful. The sound is good. It's, it's terrific stereo. This particular recording of Cozy also stars Elisabeth Schwarzkopf. It has Christa Ludwig in the cast and conducted by Karl Böhm. Another live recording that you might find interesting is a more modern recording on EMI Angel, and that is the recording conducted by Riccardo Muti. There are two wonderful contemporary recordings of Così fan tutte, recorded just in the last few years. One conducted by Daniel Berenboim, another conducted by Sir Neville Mariner. The Berenboim features Ferruccio Furlanetto in the role of Guglielmo, and Furlanetto certainly is no stranger to San Diego audiences. But I think the finest contemporary recording of Così is probably the recording conducted by Sir Neville Mariner with his wonderful orchestra, St. Martin in the Fields. This is a brilliant recording that moves like quicksilver. I think you'll really enjoy it, and I highly recommend it for listening prior to seeing the opera. Mozart and da Ponte called Così fan tutte a dramma giacosa. Has a little bit of drama, a little bit of frivolity, some comedy, and serious at the core. I'm really looking forward to seeing this piece in the theater. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera. And have some of this. Awesome.